Hello, and welcome to the Low Carb Conversations podcast. I am your host, Holly Jean, and today our guest is Dr. David Jockers. Um, Dr. Jockers is a doctor of natural medicine, and he runs one of the most popular natural health and wellness websites, drjockers.com. I refer to that website all the time. Um, It has gotten over 1 million monthly visitors, and his work has been seen on popular media sites such as a Dr. Oz show, the Hallmark Home, and family. Um, In addition to being all over the internet, Dr. Jockers is also the author of the best-selling book, The Keto Metabolic Breakthrough, um, and that is by Victory Belt Publishing and also The Fasting Transformation. Uh, He is a world-renowned expert in the area of ketosis, fasting, inflammation, and natural nutrition, and he is also the host of the popular uh, podcast, uh, Dr. Jocker's functional nutrition. Um, he lives in Canton, Georgia with his wife and angel, and he has two boys, David and Joshua and a daughter joyful. And I know you have one also on the way right. any moment now. So welcome to the show, Dr. Jockers. Thanks so much, Holly. It's really an honor. Appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Yeah, um, we are so excited to have you on the show. I think I first saw you a couple years ago at the Truth About Cancer event here in Anaheim, California. Mm. Um, And I just loved everything you had to say about how inflammation and using diet to reduce inflammation, which is the root cause of so many known diseases that we are seeing pop up in the world today. And I just remember sitting there kind of like, like mind blown. So thank you so much for just like getting the word out and spreading information. Cause I know that it's information like this, that really will change the trajectory of where we are going in health in this country. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Holly. Um, I mean, we have an epidemic of inflammation and so we, we really have to get this message out. And that's why I love this medium of podcast, um, you know, obviously speaking at conferences, but we've just got to get this information out. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so I know you, we mentioned that you are an expert in ketosis and fasting and stuff, but mm-hmm. how did you, how did you come to be where you are today? Can you walk us a little bit through like your journey and your um, professional career? For sure. Well, growing up, my mom was actually very health conscious. She actually was studying to become a massage therapist. And then later on, as I was a teenager, she was studying to be a naturopath. And she was very much into gardening and growing her own food as much as possible. And she was experimenting with different things. Um, You know, we were on a a vegetarian diet, macrobiotic diet, I know for a while when I was growing up. And, um, you know, and, and I was always into sports. And so my mom got me to eat healthier, just based around my athletic performance. She would have like this you know, cooked kale or something like that. And I was like, why do I have to eat this? And she would say stuff like, this is going to give you more energy. It's going to help you be able to perform better and recover from, um, you know, the challenges that you're dealing with, with sports and anything that could help my performance. I was all about it. If it was something that, you know, would help prevent acne, I was all about that as well. So she knew how to spoke to, she knew how to, how to, how to speak to me and, uh, and influence me to eat healthier. And so I was a healthier eater than most kids growing up, but I always had digestive issues and it didn't really um, hit home until I was in my early twenties. I was a personal trainer. So I, I got into health as well. I was a personal trainer and I was eating six meals a day from the time I woke up. And then of course, eating right before I went to bed. Um, and I was doing this and I thought I had to do it in order to maintain my muscle mass. In fact, I was taking nutrition classes in my undergrad and, um, I, we had to count up all of our calories and I, and, and I was counting them up and I was consuming on average about 5,500 calories a day. So, you know, the average individual is consuming like 2000 to 2,500. So I was consuming more than twice the amount the average individual was. And all of a sudden I started developing severe digestive issues. So it went from just uncomfortable issues I would have from time to time to pretty severe where I'd have bloating, cramping, constipation, diarrhea. And there were days where I had to call into work because I had just so much cramping and, and pain in my gut. And I started a, a track where I would actually started losing weight. And I ended up losing 30 pounds over about a two year period of time. And I was trying to eat as much as I could lift weights. Um, and yet the, the weight just kept coming off. And at the time I was actually starting graduate school 
And um, somebody turned me on to uh, Dr. Mercola, drmercola.com. And this was back in 2004, 2005. And I also read the book, The Maker's Diet. And so The Maker's Diet by Jordan Rubin, a great book. He talked about the importance of sprouting things, right? And fermented foods and grass-fed, organic, sustainably raised animal products. And uh, Mercola and Paul Check were some of my people that I was reading their books and they were talking about grain-free diets and um, a low carb lifestyle. And this is before the term paleo came around. And, uh, you know, I started doing that. So I was a vegetarian. I changed what I was doing. Um, and I went on more of a lower carb template, lower carb diet, um, getting grass fed organic animal products. We called it back then. This is before the paleo diet, before keto. We called it the healing diet. It was actually called the cellular healing diet. One of my uh, mentors as well, Dr. Dan Pompa. He also has a, po a great podcast. Um, I had met him and he was talking about this sort of diet where it was a very fat centric diet. We focused on healthy fats, avocados, olives, olive oil, coconut oil, grass fed butter, things like that. Healthy animal products. We got rid of the bad fats, got rid of sugars and grains. And I started doing a lot better following that sort of a diet. And then I noticed you know, as my body was getting better at burning fat for fuel, I noticed that I just didn't feel as good eating breakfast in the morning. And I had 7 a.m. classes in graduate school. So, um, you know, it was really easy to, to just skip skip eating before I left for class. And I would drink a lot of water between the time I woke up and midday. And I wasn't hungry. I noticed that I just felt better. I was actually more mentally alert in class. I, I just felt great um, fasting. And I had, there was no term for intermittent fasting. This was 2005. Nobody was talking about this. And uh, I, I started gaining the weight back and I felt better than ever. And I put on, you know, the 30 pounds I had lost. I put that on, felt stronger than ever. I was recovering from my workouts better, better mental clarity, better daily uh, energy and endurance. And I was really eating, I was compressing my meals and I was eating around uh, roughly around three o'clock in the afternoon. And I would eat till about seven or eight o'clock. So it was like a four or five hour eating window each day. And um, I was fasting in between that. And I just felt absolutely amazing. And so I started this sort of lifestyle and then I graduated and I opened my clinic. And this is uh, 2009, early 2009, the economy had crashed here in the United States and I couldn't get a business loan. So I opened it up on credit cards. I opened it up. It was, you know, just a, a, a miraculous story how I even got my clinic open. And I was in tremendous amount of debt. And, uh, you know, I, I just was working around the clock. And with that came more emotional eating, comfort eating, because I was working so many hours. I was sleep deprived. And uh, so I would eat, you know, binge eat late at night. And I ended up, and I was, I was showering across the street at a 24 hour gym. I was living in my clinic actually for the first two years uh, while I was paying off my student loans and everything. And I had a lot of success, but at the same time, I was always fearful that I was going to fail. And during that period of time, I ended up uh, developing skin cancer and skin cancer is what killed my grandfather. He had metastatic melanoma. So his skin cancer had spread throughout his body into his bones. And I grew up on the beach in Florida and have been sunburned a lot more than, than somebody should be during the course of their life. So I had the risk factors. And um, that was really, I was 2011. And so I ended up buying a home close to my clinic, getting shower filters, just creating more balance. I wasn't sleeping well. I had a lot of fear of failure. So I was just really working on myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. I hired an associate doctor to help reduce my load, reduce stress, uh, cut down my work hours. And then that was when I discovered the ketogenic diet. And that was when really when uh, Dr. Mercola had just started talking about it. And there was a great book, uh, The Metabolic Theory of Cancer by Dr. Thomas Seyfried. And so I read that book. I started uh, implementing that along with uh, the intermittent fasting. And I did an extended fast as well. And I ended up uh, healing that skin cancer naturally on my own. And uh, that was in 2011. Oh, wow. And then ever since then, you know, I, I got really passionate about low carb ketogenic style diets and intermittent fasting. And I've been teaching that ever since. And I created my website as really a great resource tool uh, to help people. And, you know, that's really taken on a life of its own. It's obviously a very popular website. And, uh, you know, we just really, my team and I really pride ourselves in creating the world's best health content um, from a podcast perspective. We have our podcasts and then also from, uh, from an article blog content perspective as well to really help resource people to take back control of their health. 
Yeah. Wow. What a powerful story. Like, so you've been, you've been able to cover it all from the vegetarian to going like paleo yeah. before paleo was cool. And, um, now doing the ketosis, but what a powerful testimony to be able mm-hmm. to reverse your own cancer. Yeah, um, for sure. So what do you think is the most beneficial thing of doing a ketogenic diet? I know even still now, there's a lot of skepticism out there, um, especially as like the vegan movement continues to gain momentum. Um, And even though there's people coming out all the time with these amazing stories of how a ketogenic diet and putting in fasting can really reverse some of these diseases, there's still so much pushback and resistance to that. Why do you think that is? Well, I think for a number of reasons, I think, you know, from a resistance perspective, uh, you know, we've just been taught for so long that your fat makes us fat, that, that eating fat creates heart disease, drives up our cholesterol. I remember I just had a conversation with some friends of ours from church who are very health conscious people. They exercise regularly. They're into doing, you know, triathlons and all kinds of stuff like that. Very health conscious people. And, um, you know, the, one of them is actually on a ketogenic diet, but he was telling me, he's like, yeah, he's like, I try to watch out for the amount of cholesterol in foods. Right. And I, I was trying to explain to him that dietary cholesterol, what we're eating as far as a cholesterol perspective is not actually going to impact our blood cholesterol, but really a things that cause problems with blood cholesterol, which we call the terrible triad, high LDL, low HDL, high triglycerides really have to do with insulin resistance and blood sugar dysregulation. And so he still, he just couldn't really understand it because again, he had been taught for so long, you know, this old model. And so I think it's hard to, you know, they, they say the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who can't read and write in our, in our culture today, you know, vast majority of people, 99.99% can read and write. So the illiterate now are people who can't learn something and then realize that what they learned is actually not right. And then actually unlearn it and relearn something new. And that really takes a skill. And so, so many people have learned one model. And so it's hard for them to understand this, this idea that fats and, you know, eating animal fats and things like that can actually be, be, be healthy for us. And there's so much disinformation out there as well, um, telling them the opposite, right? And, and a lot of propaganda saying that these things are bad for us based on, you know, really poor, poorly designed uh, epidemiological studies that are not, you know, looking at real, real causative factors, but it's more correlative. And uh, they're, they're not, they're not adding in the healthy user bias, because, you know, really, up until maybe the last 10 years or so, people who are health conscious tended to stay away more so from, you know, animal protein and animal fat. And so they tended to, follow more of a plant-based diet. And then they also exercised, had better sleep habits and all these other components. And the people that tended to eat more animal products also smoked, um, you know, drank alcohol, ate a whole bunch of, you know, processed fats because they would eat French fries and, you know, and things like that. So they, so the healthy user bias, you know, really uh, affects the way that a lot of these studies are done. And, and, you know, a lot of people that are out there in the media that are you know, we'll, we'll take a certain study. They don't, they don't explain the results of that, that study in such a way that um, helps the, the person that's listening or the, or the person that's reading the article to understand the healthy user bias. And people will say stuff like a high fat diet. And you look at the actual macronutrient content of that high fat diet. And it's like 40% fat, 40% carbs. That's not a low carb ketogenic diet right? I mean, that's way too many carbs. And so when you have high car- high carbs, like 40% of your calories, that's going to create a higher insulin load. And then you're also topping on that higher fats, you're going to have more inflammation in the system. So, you know, you really, it's, it's not the same model as a low carb or ketogenic template. So, you know, with that said, that's all affecting it. But really the reason why I follow a ketogenic template, and I'm not always you know, I would say I always have ketones in my system. However, I'm not always in a deep state of ketosis. I cycle in and out. But the reason why I do it is really for mental clarity and energy. Like I just feel very, very energized and I have, my brain feels really, really good. And I have better energy, better endurance, better mental clarity. And that's really why I do it is for performance benefits. But then it's also nice to know that 
I'm actually enhancing my mitochondrial function, which is really the reason why I'm performing better because our brain right. is so dense with mitochondria. Um, and by having healthier mitochondria, I'm going to age better. Uh, my skin is going to be healthier. I'm going to have, you know, better vision. You know, my, my, my entire, my longevity is going to be healthy because I'm taking good care of my mitochondria. And that's one of the, the, the great benefits of a ketogenic template. Yes. Wow. And also, um, reducing inflammation just in yes. general, right? That's right. Keeping inflammation yeah. under control. Yep. Yeah. So now, um, I think people are starting to hear more, um, buzz about inflammation and how it's linked to a root cause of so many different diseases, such as cancer and diabetes and Alzheimer's and stuff. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, um, the role inflammation plays in the body and those disease pathways? Well, for sure. Actually, inflammation is one of the most important immune processes in your entire body. Without inflammation, we would all die quickly from infections. In fact, throughout the history of mankind, more people have actually died from systemic or body-wide infections than anything else. So, you know, when you get a cut or a wound, like our ancestors would get all the time because you know, they may be at war or be attacked by an animal or, you know, they, they were, they were more active and working outdoors. So they would, you know, have cuts on their hands and their legs and stuff like that, as opposed to, you know, people like me that work from my desk, you know, I'm not really exposed to the same things, but our ancestors were constantly getting flesh wounds. And so what happens there is bacteria and other microorganisms will get into the bloodstream. And if they are able to get into the bloodstream and then really colonize certain areas and grow out of control, they'll get into the nervous system and create things like meningitis or encephalitis, where they just um, infect the brain tissue, the, the nervous system tissue, the, the meninges or the lungs and create pneumonia. And this is what people used to die from all the time. In fact, more people, you know, when they, when they were being in war, it was actually not very common, it, like it was less common for them to die from, you know, a spear or a sword, the actual laceration, but more so they would die from the infection that would occur from the laceration. So mm -hmm. because of that, our body has adapted because our bodies are built for survival. So we've adapted over the years and we've created this inflammatory process. And the goal of inflammation is to prevent against a systemic infection from killing you. So when we know, when we experience abnormal proteins in our bloodstream, the body starts driving up these inflammatory pathways. So when you get a cut or a wound or you sprain your ankle, you know, there's acute inflammation that occurs. And that inflammation is a really key part of the healing process. And again, it also prevents against infection. And that's just, you know, a normal healthy response. The problem is when this, inf this inflammation just goes just continues without being stopped, right? And where, where it becomes chronic. And in our society, the main issue we're dealing with is leaky gut. So we have damage in our gut lining. Our gut lining is only one cell wall. And so that is very easy. It's like cheesecloth and it can easily rip. And when it rips, now large undigested proteins are getting into the bloodstream, bacteria, yeast, different uh, pathogens and microorganisms get into the bloodstream and again, the body does what it was assigned to do, drives up inflammation to prevent those things from killing us quickly. The problem is, again, that it's just a continual process because our gut, we're continually bringing in food. We've got so much bacteria in there, and they're constantly going through the, the, the openings in the, in the gut junction. So it's just driving up inflammation that we're not able to turn off. And so now we end up with chronic inflammation. That creates an immune response that damages tissues. It might damage the thyroid. It might damage the brain. The way you know you have brain inflammation is, are you experiencing things like depression, anxiety, brain fog, uh, you know, just trouble remembering things, headaches, right? These are all kind of warning signs of inflammation in your brain. And then over time, that can lead to you know, just permanent damage of brain tissues where you end up with things like dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, different neurodegenerative conditions. You may end up with uh, you know, metabolism issues where you're storing fat. That can be a chronic inflammatory process that's, that's actually contributing to that. Thyroid issues. Um, you have issues with, um, with joint pain, for example, pain right in different regions of the body. Again, another sign of chronic inflammation, skin issues, eczema, acne, psoriasis, 
These are all signs of inflammation in the body and we've got to get it under control. Again, inflammation is normal and healthy when it's balanced, um, but when it's chronic, that's when we have the issues, right? And that's when um, you know we, we've got to go in and really make changes, changes with our lifestyle, changes with, uh, you know, we have to look at key issues. Like, are we having uh, some sort of a chronic systemic infection? Do we, are we nutrient deficient? Do we have certain nutrient deficiencies that can contribute to that, like vitamin D and zinc, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like that. So that's really where inflammation comes in. And in today's day and age, people aren't dying typically from systemic infections. They're usually dying from, so from, the, from chronic inflammatory conditions, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, um, neurodegenerative conditions, right? These are what's killing people and, and robbing people of quality, quality years of life. And that's what we've got to get under control. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, making that differentiation, differentiation between the acute inflammation and the chronic inflammation. I think most people yeah. can understand that. Yes, our body is supposed to inflame to be able to fight off um, an injury or uh, an acute illness or something, but it is that chronic inflammation that leads to problems. But it's like, we don't wake up one day and just automatically have diabetes. We don't just wake up one day and yeah. have cancer. Like it's a progression of this chronic inflammation. But the other thing is that so many of these symptoms of inflammation are what's considered just like normal um, because it's so common for people to not feel well. It's so common for people to have digestive issues or to have brain fog or to not have any energy. Um, and so I think that's really the challenge is getting people to understand that no, these, these symptoms are not normal. Like we are meant to feel vibrant and alive and energized every day, not bogged down and lethargic and with aches and pains everywhere. So um, I think one of the one the easiest areas really to talk to people for me at least is about inflammation and the damage it can cause is through the gut connection because people are starting to be more accepting of that and familiar with that gut brain connection. Um, and you touched on it a little bit, and but since it is part of your story and your healing from digestion, can you talk a little bit more, uh, go into more detail about the gut connection and inflammation and how that works in the body? Yeah. So our gut obviously is where we break down and absorb nutrients and, you know, our gut lining, again, it's only one cell wall. And when we think about, for example, like our skin or, you know, other barriers, like our skin is a barrier it's multicellular. So there's many different layers that help protect the skin from any sort of injury or insult. Whereas with the gut, it's only one cell. Now they're held, those cells are held in by what's called tight junctions. And so those tight junctions help hold them really close together. Okay. And the intestinal cells are constantly turning over. In fact, we replace our gut lining every three to five days. So these cells don't live for very long. Okay, but when we have food that's going through food, the act of eating itself is actually promotes inflammation. And that's because when we're eating food, there's pathogens on the food, even if it was freshly cooked just from the air, while we take it from, you know, the oven or whatever, we're cooking it, you know, from the stovetop to our plate, there's bacteria, different microorganisms are getting on that food. When we eat the food, so we chew it and we swallow it and it gets into our stomach, we need to produce a lot of stomach acid in order to sterilize it. The goal of stomach acid is to sterilize food, meaning kill off bacteria. Then it also helps to uh, digest protein, break down protein into smaller molecules that are easier to digest. And it also helps to kind of move things from the stomach and into the small intestine. There's a sphincter called the pyloric sphincter, helps open and activate that. It also helps us absorb key minerals like magnesium and zinc and iron. And it activates uh, or it activates the, a protein called intrinsic factor that helps us absorb vitamin B12. So we need to have really good stomach acid. Now at rest, for example, it's, if we're talking about acid, uh, uh, water is typically neutral, about 7.0 on the pH scale. At rest, our stomach acid levels are roughly around 3 to 3.5 pH, which is very acidic. However, in order to digest protein, like let's say we're going to eat a steak, 
we actually need to get that stomach acid level to about 1.5 to 2.2. That's actually very energy demanding for our body to create enough acid to be able to break that down and metabolize it. Now, in order to do that, we actually need to be in a relaxed state. So our sympathetic nervous system or our fight or flight nervous system mm -hmm. is the antagonist to good, healthy digestive juice production. So we should be in a relaxed state when we consume food. And that allows our vagus nerve, which is a cranial nerve, cranial nerve 10, which runs from our brainstem down into our, our, our vital organs and into our digestive system. And that's what activates the production of stomach acid. So we need to get that acid really low in order, again, to sterilize the food, in order to break down the protein, open up the pyloric sphincter and allow food to move into the small intestine. When we're not able to do that, we can't sterilize the food effectively. And that's also important because we have acid loving bacteria and we have alkaline loving bacteria. So the acid should kill off the alkaline loving pathogens. Right. And then the acid, the acidic bolus. So when we are, when we are, we have like a pre-digested food in our stomach, they call it a bolus. And that mm -hmm. starts to move into the small intestine and the acidity there um, of the bolus triggers a hit certain receptors in the, in the front part of the small intestine, the proximal portion that activate the release of bile and bile is an emulsifying agent that helps break down fat, like soap on, on grease, for example, helps break the fatty acids into small molecules that we can digest, but also alkaline is also a sterilizing agent and it kills off the acid loving bacteria and microbes. So this really helps keep inflammation under control is getting good stomach acid production and bile flow. And then we also have pancreatic enzymes that come in and uh, bicarbonate that's released by the pancreas that allows us to create an, an alkaline environment in the small intestine. So stomach needs to be acidic, small intestine alkaline. And what happens is in our society, we're always eating on the go, right? So it's like, we're not taking time to be relaxed when we're eating, we're eating on the go. I mean, even the idea of fast food is, is, is the worst thing, you know, just eating on the go, eating while we're driving, things like that. It's the worst thing we can be doing for good digestion. And most people are not producing enough stomach acid. They're not sterilizing their gut. And then they're not breaking down these, uh, the foodstuffs effectively. And so now they've got large undigested food molecules getting into their intestines. They're not sterilizing well. So they end up with overgrowth of, of bacteria and then increased amount of fermentation that takes place in the small intestine. Mm -hmm. And that drives up inflammation in the system. And so that damages the gut lining. So gut lining becomes open. And now, you know, we get an influx of proteins that get into the, uh, into the bloodstream. On top of that, we're eating foods that are just inflammatory. We're eating things like gluten, for example, which is known right. to um, cause gapping of, that, of those tight junctions and open up the, the gut. Um, other foods that we might be sensitive to, dairy, processed sugars. We're eating foods that have a lot of chemicals, pesticides and herbicides that damage our gut bacteria, uh, drive up inflammation in our gut, create more tearing in that gut junction, and that causes problems. And then we're just eating too often. So we're eating throughout the day, and a lot of people are eating before they go to bed. They're eating when they wake up in the morning. So they're never giving their digestive system a break. And you need that break to reduce the amount of mechanical stress so the gut lining can heal. It's kind of like if you sprain your ankle, you don't want to just walk and run on your ankle. You want to give it time to rest and heal. It's kind of the same thing. If we're eating foods and living a lifestyle that's um, inherently damaging to our gut lining, which pretty much all of us are, um, even if we're eating a healthy diet, we're still consuming food that is a mechanical stressor. It's a, it's a stress load on the gut. We need to be giving it a break from time to time to allow um, the gut lining to heal. And fortunately, again, we said the, the gut lining, those cells heal every three to five days. So they heal quickly. We just got to give it a break from time to time. Um, you know, basically do things like what we call intermittent fasting to take stress off the gut and allow it to heal and seal. And that will significantly reduce inflammation in our body. Yeah. Yeah. It is a lot easier once you, once you switch over to a ketogenic or a high fat, low carb style of eating to do that intermittent fasting. Yeah. Cause if you're just still eating like the standard American diet with lots of carbs, you're still having, um, intense hunger cravings. You're wanting to eat all the time. And so it's a lot harder to give your digestion that rest, um, when you're, when you're not eating the appropriate foods as well. Um, 
And the other thing is like, I think one of the most common, common over-the-counter drugs is um, like digestive stuff to um, reduce stomach yeah. acid because we're eating in such right. a fast state. So people are having digestive yeah. problems thinking, oh, I have too much acid. I need to take a pill for that. And that's just compounding the problem of not having enough stomach acid to properly digest. Yeah, absolutely. So proton pump inhibitors, PPIs, or acid blocking medications are one of the most prescribed medications. And, you know, so many people are dealing with heartburn and things like that. And we're told to just pop these, but when we take uh -huh. these, they definitely can relieve heartburn, but they actually create more alkaline environment in our stomach, which doesn't allow us to absorb minerals effectively, doesn't allow us to break down protein, creates more inflammation in our gut and more long-term problems. In fact, there's studies that have shown that taking long-term PPIs, these, these, again, these acid blocking medications actually increases our risk of early mortality. People that take these for a long period of time, right? For over a year at a time are dying earlier, right? And so they have a higher rate of cancer, heart disease, um, all these different inflammatory conditions, again, because they're not absorbing things well, they're creating bacterial overgrowth, more inflammation in their gut, um, B12 deficiencies, zinc deficiencies, you know, so we really have to get these things under control. And when you have heartburn, it's a warning sign, right? And so there may be um, some benefit in short-term relief, you know, so you're not scarring up your esophagus. So short-term relief of PPIs can be, can be helpful for some, in some cases, people with stomach ulcers, for example. Um, however, our goal should be really, let's get to the root cause, which is typically food intolerances, bacterial overgrowths, um, you know, remove the foods that are causing these kinds of issues, clean up the diet. If you have gut infections, address those gut infections and, uh, you know, and then get off these medications as quickly as possible and restore normal acidity to your stomach so you can digest and absorb these nutrients effectively and keep inflammation under control. Yeah. I'm not just put a, a bandaid over it. Yeah. Um, I have an article here. I don't want to go into too many yeah. details of it, but it's talking about the special diets that may boost the power of drugs to kind of battle cancers. Mm -hmm. And since we we're talking about keto for healing in terms of digestion, um, let's switch over to talking about keto for maybe cancer, or maybe some of the more um, serious diseases that people are battling. So this is um, an oncologist. He's, she's launching a, cr a clinical trial where she's trying to make a cancer drug more effective by also pairing it with a ketogenic diet with, um, with her patients. Um, this doctor is not the first to suggest a particular diet to aid in cancer treatments. I think that's been done before, but um, this article also mentions that this approach of using diet and nutrition um, for cancer is still kind of a fringy alternative medicine idea. Um, but then there's so much proof that these things help. So how can, how does keto or feeding the body with ketones help the body promote healing and recovering from cancer. Yes. And so we know that a ketogenic style diet keeps inflammation under control and it also helps keep insulin under control. So in order for your body to endogenously, which is basically uh, create from the inside endogenously produce ketones, insulin has to be down and that's important. Insulin plays a very important role in our body. When our blood sugar is elevated, insulin brings blood sugar down by pulling it into the cells. That's important because high blood sugar, when your sugars are high, the sugar molecules will bind to proteins and create what we call sticky proteins. And another term for them is advanced glycation end products, AGEs. And what do they do? They accelerate the aging process. AGEs are highly reactive. They create inflammation. They damage our blood vessels, creating uh, endothelial dysfunction and, and atherosclerosis in our blood vessels. They damage the kidneys, the nerves. So insulin helps prevent against that. However, when insulin's elevated, insulin signals cells to divide. It's a building hormone. It tells, it tells your body to store fat, promote the, the production of inflammation, and increase the amount of cell division. And this is an environment where cancer really thrives. Cancer cells themselves have somewhere between 10 to 50 times more insulin receptors than normal cells. Why is that? Because they love to use sugar as fuel. So it's a very quick, easy fuel. And cancer cells, they have 
they're metabolically disrupted cells. So the mitochondria are very poor at burning fat or ketones for fuel. And they pretty much, you know, run off of glucose metabolism. So they need insulin in order to get the glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cell. So they upregulate all their insulin receptors. So when we go on a, a low carb ketogenic style diet, we're lowering our insulin, um, keeping right. blood sugar stable. And then our body can run, our normal cells can run off of fat, fatty acids. Okay. The only cells, you know, well, some of the only cells that struggle to do that are going to be red blood cells, for example. And then also your brain, because you can't get fatty acids, the fatty acid molecule across the blood brain barrier effectively. It's too large. So that's where our liver creates ketones. It takes fatty acids and converts them into a water soluble, smaller molecule called a ketone that can now slip through the blood brain barrier and fuel the brain. So for example, if you've gone a few hours without eating and you feel irritable and nauseous and you have a headache, that's a sign your blood sugar has dropped too low and your body is not good at creating ketones and utilizing them for energy. Normally, and, and when your body gets what we call fat adapted or keto adapted, that's when your body is good at taking fat, converting it into ketones and getting it in, in through the blood brain barrier into the brain so you can use it for fuel. Then you can go multiple hours without eating and you actually feel great because your body's running off of those ketones. So ketones are produced in a low insulin environment. And a low insulin environment is basically it metabolically stresses the cancer cell. The cancer cells need to drive most of their energy from burning sugar. So if it, blood sugar is low or stable and that we're not getting a continual influx of sugar and um, we're not getting this flux of insulin on a regular basis, then cancer cells become metabolically starved, right? And so now they're very, very hungry and they're going, they have mechanisms to try to uh, create more blood sugar, higher blood sugar and things like that. But that is a great environment now to bring in some sort of oxidative stress, right? So we want to metabolically stress cancer cells. That makes them more susceptible. And that's what a ketogenic style diet does. And then we can bring in some sort of an oxidative therapy. And oxidation is basically like rusting. And we, we really want to, you know, create some sort of environment where we can really rust or damage or what they call kill these cancer cells, right? So chemotherapy, for example, is an oxidative therapy that you know is is toxic to all cells of our body how do we selectively focus it on cancer cells we can metabolically stress the cancer cells so now they're starving they're going to gobble up the chemotherapy so there are two ways of doing this um, one is through a low carb ketogenic diet um, which is really my preferred way and another way is you can do what's called insulin potentiating chemotherapy where um, you basically, you inject insulin, kind of like diabetics inject insulin right before you give the chemotherapy. And then the cancer cells see the insulin comes in. So they think, okay, it's eating time. So now they start gobbling up what's in the bloodstream, which is the chemotherapy. They take it in, it kills those cancer cells. And that's actually been shown to be very effective and it helps spare normal cells while killing off more of the cancer cells, which reduces your side effects. But you know what? You can do it without the insulin because injecting insulin itself has a lot of different, um, there's a lot of uh, downsides to that. So by going on a, a ketogenic low carb diet, the cancer cells are always in a state at that point where they're starving. So they're looking to try to grab whatever they can out of the bloodstream. Uh, and that's where you bring in the chemotherapy and now it can damage those cancer cells and preserve the normal cells. Now, radiation would act the same way where basically the cancer cells would take up more of that radiation. So, and it would help preserve and strengthen the normal cells because ketones are strengthening for normal cells. When normal cells get good at utilizing ketones, they become more stress resilient. Ketones themselves are a very clean energy source. You produce a lot of energy and very little metabolic waste, as opposed to burning sugar, you produce very little energy and a lot of metabolic waste. So we can turn the body into really a good, fat burner and good at utilizing ketones, we produce less oxidative stress. We also increase the amount of mitochondria in healthy cells 
So we get some a process called mitochondrial biogenesis, where we increase the amount of mitochondria. The more healthy mitochondria that are within our cells, the more stress resilient our cells are. So if we're going to stress the cells with radiation, with chemotherapy, we, we better have stress resilient cells to be able to handle that. And that's what yeah. creating that ketogenic environment does. And then if you didn't want to do, um, you know, oxidative therapies like chemo or radiation, or if you want to do like natural things in conjunction, you can do things like hyperbaric oxygen. Oxygen is toxic to cancer cells. They're anaerobic. Oxygen is strengthening to normal cells. So it makes our normal cells healthier, but actually it's toxic to cancer cells. So it, it can help selectively target them. Um, IV vitamin C, vitamin C is strengthening the normal cells, but toxic to cancer cells when we bring it in intravenously like that. Ozone, IV ozone would be another strategy. So basically it's this idea of pressing and pulsing the cancer. And this is, this is actually the concept derived from Dr. Thomas Seyfried. I told you guys, I read that book metabolic theory of cancer. And he is one of the top researchers. I believe he's at Boston University or Boston College, one of those places. And this is what he does. He studies the impact of ketogenic diet with oxidative therapies on cancer models, right? Different cancer models, brain tumor models and other models. And he termed the idea of the press pulse model to treat cancer. So we press it metabolically with that low carb ketogenic style diet, intermittent fasting, extended fasting, partial fasting strategies. And then we pulse it with the oxidative therapies. Wow. Sorry, I was taking notes there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll definitely link that, um, that book up in the show notes because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who want to look at that. So given that information, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to think along those lines that if you're already following a ketogenic diet before a diagnosis of cancer or before um, any kind of like a serious health diagnosis, you would actually be more resilient and maybe less susceptible to even developing cancer in the first place. If you're not always having a body that's full of um, insulin and sugar. Yeah, absolutely. From a preventative okay. perspective, doing things to help create more metabolic health, healthier mitochondria, um, and less oxidative stress on your system, the, 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 that's going to give you a greater chance to prevent the formation of cancer and really all degenerative diseases. Um, I want to circle back because I know you have a, a summit coming up is the chronic inflammation summit yeah. where, um, will you be talking? I know you'll be talking about keto, um, mm -hmm. and probably fasting, but what are some other things that people will be learning about in this, um, chronic? Inflammation yeah, summit? yeah, for sure. The chronic inflammation summit. Um, you know, I interviewed the top experts in the world and we're talking about inflammation in all different regions of the body. So I have, you know, dermatologists talking about inflammation in the skin, I have neurologists talking about brain inflammation, um, you know, people talking about thyroid disorders and really inflammation, how it impacts all the different regions of our body. And then we're talking about the best labs, the best strategies. So what labs to look at to see if you have underlying markers of inflammation, you may not even have any symptoms, but you may have elevations on certain lab markers. Um, we also talk about the best strategies to get inflammation under control. So not just dietary, but also supplement wise, uh, other modalities. We talk about infrared sauna, you know, lots of different strategies that you can utilize to keep inflammation under control. So really that should be on a daily basis. You should be thinking, what am I doing today to keep inflammation under control? Because inflammation can get out of control very, very quickly um, based on our environment, what, you know, what kind of stressors we're under, if we encounter an infection, if we have trauma, um, you know, all these different factors. And so we need to be doing things on a regular basis, to keep inflammation under control. The summit is all about helping arm it and equip you to be able to do that. Okay. That sounds great. I like that. You said that you're going to be going over labs too, because I, I hear so often that people, go and get labs done and their doctors say everything's normal, everything's normal, you look fine. And then, but they're still having symptoms. They're still having problems yeah. or the next thing they know there is a serious diagnosis and you're like, but my labs all look fine. And um, having people understand that there's a difference between 
like regular labs and functional lab ranges because they're not all they're not all the same. So yeah, for sure. That's important. Um, that's fantastic. I will be sure to link that up. Um, one of the questions I get most often um, is from even just suggesting someone do a keto diet or a low carb, high fat type of diet is, is this something that I have to do forever? Um, how long does it take? How hard is it? Like, what is your best advice for someone who may be facing some serious health problems, yeah. but is so brand new to even this concept of mm -hmm. using nutrition or diet or health. Um, but what is your best advice for that person? Yeah. I, I always start with these three principles. Number one is reduce the amount of sugar grains and starches that you're consuming. Okay. So you don't necessarily need to eliminate all of those. Uh, in some cases it would be beneficial, but definitely reduce the amount that you're consuming. Number one, number two is get rid of the bad fats. That's going to be all of your process, highly processed vegetable oils, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, cottonseed oil, peanut oil, canola oil, get rid of these things. You're going to find, where are you going to find them? Processed foods and also condiments. You need to look at your condiments and make sure that your salad dressing doesn't have cottonseed oil or canola oil in it. So get rid of those, add in a lot of good fats, things like avocados, avocado oil, olives, olive oil, coconut oil, coconut, uh, healthy coconut fats. You can find them in like coconut milk, coconut flakes, coconut butter, um, grass-fed butter is a great healthy fat source. Eggs, pasture-raised eggs, really good uh, fat source as well. And then do your best to try to get grass-fed organic animal products. That way you can reduce the amount of uh, toxins that are coming in your system. Our model is to consume the maximal amount of nutrients and the minimal amount of toxins. And so when an animal eats grains, particularly pesticide-laden grains, they bioaccumulate those chemicals, right? Glyphosate, which is right. you know linked to cancers, um, along with many other different pesticides and herbicides. And so they bioaccumulate those things. And on top of that, the grains actually create fatty acid imbalances where they end up with high omega-6 fats, low omega-3, and that will end up driving up inflammation in the system as well. So you do your best. You may not always be able to get organic products, but do your best to try to get organic grass-fed animal products. And if you, for whatever reason, your grocery stores don't have those, you can also order, there's companies like US Wellness Meats and Butcher Box yeah. and places like that, Slankers, that will ship directly to your door. That like you can order, you know, almost any type of meat and they'll ship it to your door. And that way you're able to get wild caught fish, um, grass fed organic animal products, which are some of the most nutrient dense foods you can put in your body. So make those three changes to start. And I think you'll start to see some big, uh, some big changes with your health. Those are good suggestions. And I know people complain about the price of um, those organic grass fed meats, but once you're eating that many nutrients, you don't need to eat as much because your body is mm -hmm. satisfied. So, um, and I will say that you will not be finding those healthy fats and those grass fed beefs at a drive through. So don't yeah. look there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Traditional idea of fast food, uh, you know, that's going to be poison. It's going to definitely uh, affect you negatively in a health perspective. Yeah. Um, well, I will also recommend your two books for maybe new people to get started. Yeah. The Keto Metabolic Breakthrough and the Fasting. Um, is it Fasting Transformation? The fasting Transformation. Yeah, that's that book is, you know, just something I'm so proud of because I mean, it really intermittent fasting is what saved and transformed my life. And it's the easiest. It's, it's you know, I always tell people it's the most ancient, inexpensive, and powerful healing strategy known to mankind because all of our ancestors practice some level of fasting. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have pantries, right? Food was scarce. So when they had a lot of food, they feasted. When they didn't have food, they fasted. This is built into our DNA. It doesn't cost us anything. And honestly, from what I've seen over the years, it is the most powerful healing uh, strategy. When you fast, your insulin levels drop, your inflammation drops, uh, your body starts increasing the amount of cell repair, so all these different, um, you know, we basically turn on gene pathways. Like there's one called autophagy where we break down old damaged mitochondria, old damaged cells, and we actually recycle the components. 
and uh, create newer, healthier, stronger, more stress resilient cells. We increase the production of stem cells. We get rid of the senescent, older, decayed cells and replace those with really strong, healthy cells. And again, it doesn't cost anything. And uh, you know, in the book, I talk about exactly how to, how to practice it, how to get started with it. And it is absolutely life transforming. Wonderful. I will definitely link those up in the show notes as well. And then our audience can find you on social. You're on Instagram yeah. or you're on Facebook. Where, where can we find you? Facebook, Facebook, Dr. David Jockers, Instagram, um, and then YouTube as well. And then also my podcast as well. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. I know you brought a lot of value to our audience. So thank you. Thank you, Holly. Appreciate it. What an honor. Yeah. All right. Thanks.